Okay, hello. We got one more minute, so we'll wait just a few seconds more because I see people are coming. I know it's going to be hard to beat uh, Dom's speaking skills, uh, but I'm really glad you are here. Let's see how good I can be. I'm also happy to be opening the kind of architecture track on the DevOx. It's actually my first DevOx ever, and I'm really uh, stunned, and it's kind of mind-blowing the scale and, uh, and all the stuff happening here. OK, so let's start. Uh, this one's going to be about the event sourcing and things I wish I knew before I started with that. Uh, I shipped some systems with working with the event sourcing. Uh, actually, I'm working on one that has like three years now, and the previous is on production currently for four years, four or five years now. Uh, so I made some mistakes. Uh, I kind of saved myself from some of these, having the knowledge from the past. And I'd like to tell you a few things that I learned over the course of these uh, several projects I, I, de I delivered or failed sometimes. So the grand plan would be the uh, first I'll tell you a story. It's kind of fictional story, but it serves the purpose. Uh, then we'll talk about debugging, auditing, and uh, kind of time traveling abilities of different source architectures. How does it work in the kind of long term maintenance and evolution of the requirements, evolution of project needs, pivoting of the businesses and stuff like that. Uh, then maybe data consistency and performance and scaling, so all the meat of the uh, of the growing projects and success successful projects. If we have time, we'll talk about read models, code decoupling a bit, and the, um, a bit more about the payloads, uh, what are the intricacies of the payloads, and what should go in the payload, what should not. So starting with a story, uh, meet Joe. Joe is a developer in a kind of fintech startup. He works in an investment space dealing with money, accounts, exchanges, balances, and all that stuff that you may know from all that kind of projects. And here the story starts. There is a request, portfolio copilot, because currently everything is AI-based, so it's kind of copilot, it markets better. As a user, I'd like my portfolio to get rebalanced every seven days. So we deposit the money to an account and kind of in an automated, smart, machine learning, AI-based way, your portfolio gets rebalanced. So appropriate trades are made in order to rebalance your portfolio and so, so that you can get uh, as much profits as possible, squeeze as much from your, from your, from your money as, as uh, possible. The thing is that company takes profits from the profits that you made, but they also pay to the external exchanges for the exchanges that they do. So there needs to be a trade-off uh, that they need to, they, they cannot do smaller exchanges and wrong exchanges because users will not profit from that. They, don't, they cannot really do more useless exchanges because they will pay for that. So uh, there is a balance uh, because of that, there is a balance of X, like threshold, that you need to have on your account in order to, to get rebalanced. Okay, sounds easy, right? Just a bunch of ifs. ChatGPT would generate it in a kind of blink of an eye. You can just write the code in like a few minutes, probably. Looks simple. It's kind of pseudocode. It's not a, nothing that will compile. Looks simple. We can just ship it. So we did. Joe ships the code. It works on production, gets deployed, no bugs, it's easy, it's kind of even tested. All that stuff is being, being prepared, adjustments are being done, next adjustments are being prepared, uh, scheduled for, for next. And the code is working on production for half a year or so. And then the product people came, uh, come to Joe and ask the question, can we tell how many adjustments or adjustment attempts were made or how many adjustments were skipped because of the fact that, let's say the threshold was 1,000 euro and user only had um, 997 or something. How many of these were that were close to the threshold so that maybe we can adjust the threshold? So kind of have a retrospective look and adjust the, the parameters of the, 
of the algorithm. And Joe is sad because he cannot really tell, because with the code that he did, it's just like adjusting, scheduling, doing stuff like that, skipping if needed. We don't have a data to do that. And Joe is sad and thinking, if only we had a log like that. So if all these three cases, like when adjustments get skipped, when adjustment gets uh, planned, and when adjustment is actually executed, what if we had that log of things that happened over the course of the uh, of the particular adjustments? And this is kind of breakthrough in a thinking. If you are working with any, if, are, if you are starting to work in an even source systems, you start to look at the systems and at the activities of the system as a sequence of events, as a sequence of facts that have happened, not this sequence of create, read, update, delete stuff in your database. That's a really breakthrough, and at the moment that that one clicks, I guess the working with event source is way easier and you are never gonna go back. But again, Joe is in his own world at the moment, so th he thinks, okay, it's, I mean, we had that, that uh, request from the, uh, from the business, that seems easy. We have the, the logic we, I showed you before. What if we just have this? We know that we are gonna skip that. So just take, grab a piece of data and save it next to the, next to the updating our, our current model, like in another table, in a JSON field or another column. Looks good. Some kind of an event-ish thing. We can even send a message to Kafka at the same time. But this one's gonna be tricky because it's like transactions and all that stuff. So he thinks that this, that's easy, like saving the data next to the, the, the updating the actual state in the database of the state of the user account, and saving together with the same transaction, saving the skipped information, the balance threshold, and all that stuff. So he ships that stuff. Works. He doesn't know about event sourcing stuff yet. Now the chapter two. There is instant smart trader, yet another part of the system for more aggressive, uh, more speculative accounts, let's say. Uh, I get a speculative account that I risk a lot in there. I want it. I want my account to be constantly monitored for that. And the requirements are the same. Like the company pays for the exchanges, it benefits from the user, but it also benefits from the user uh, user executions. And the exchanges that are made, the decisions about the uh, the adjustments are based on a, your current drift from from your from your. Uh, uh, assume threshold, market conditions, all that stuff, market trends, and all that, all, all the things around. So it's again AI ML based because everything should be uh, AI ML based these days. Ship it. We know how to do that because we did it in a previous project. So it's like just porting the code. But unfortunately, Joe is on vacation, well deserved. A new teammate Bob takes over the feature. And he doesn't really know the fact that they had the issue before, that they didn't have the data, and they kind of implemented this kind of add-on of saving this additional data next to the uh, actual state update. So he doesn't know about the stuff, so he doesn't do that. Because why? I mean, th the feature works. He gets approved from the other colleagues, and he gets that feature shipped. And then people, product people come back and say, can we tell this or that? Again, we cannot because we, have, we don't have a data. There was no enforcement that we would have to save the data. There was nothing that would enforce us, like programmatically from, programmatically from the compiler, from what kind of tools that we have, that we could save the data together with, that, with, the, uh, with the actual state change. And this one, you may know Oscar. If you are into event sourcing, you may know Oscar. Uh, this one's kind of uh, meta tweet. I'm quoting a quote. But anyway, it's even sourcing is architecturing for tomorrow's questions. That's one of the the question from the, one of the conferences that uh, that Oscar was that he tweeted. And if you can see, like go back to the slide that I show you, that if what if only if if we only had an uh, lock of the actions, we could easily go back, rewind that stuff, and get the all the information and all the answers to the questions that product asks. If only we had that saved as a part of an event. And if you start thinking about the uh, system activities as a series of events, it's kind of natural that you want to save the stuff that is important to the fact that just happened. Uh, so uh, basically, quick recap. 
uh, how event sourcing was. By the way, how many of you have a chance to work, uh, like not a theoretical but practical chance to work with an event source systems? Okay, so many of you, so I will quickly uh, go through that. So how event sourcing works. There's a system, there's a user that issues a command to, uh, to our system. Uh, you may see a kind of similarity to this uh, CQRS principle because it's kind of part of it or depending on how you see it, it's an either extension or a special case of, of, of CQRS. Uh, so user issues a command to the system and then the command reaches the command handler. And then the state gets rebuilt from the series of events that happened for given business object, business entity, aggregate, as we say in uh, domain-driven design. And the cloud here is uh, modeled as that. The state is modeled as a cloud on purpose because the state is transient. There is no such thing in an event source systems that you save the state like a row in a database. If you know the crowd-based systems, you usually think about the storage, about the persistence of your, of your uh, of, I don't know, account state in this case, uh, as a row in a database or series of rows in a database, like with one to many joins and stuff like that. In event source systems, there's no such thing as a, as a persistent state. The only thing that we persist, the only thing that we keep in, a, um, uh, in our persistent storage in a database or event store or event log, event journal, it, it has different names, it's just a series of events that happened over time during the ordered set of events that happened during time in the system. That's why when the command comes in, all the events for given business entities are kind of hydrated from the, uh, are fetched from the database, from the journal, and one by one are applied to an empty state. So we are always starting with an empty state and applying event one by one, events one by one to this, um, to this empty state. And we uh, result with a state that is built, which is kind of derivation of all the events being applied in order. And only on that state when events are uh, replied, the command gets uh, applied to the state. The command may be rejected because the state is not valid to handle the command, but the command may be handled uh, perfectly. And if command gets handled, uh, it results with uh, yet another event. One, two, many events. It depends how we modeled uh, your event stream. And these events are being appended to the storage. So again, if you can see uh, at the picture, there is no storing, uh, there is no moment that we store the state itself. There is no moment where we store the state of an account, state of a user, state of a business entity somewhere. We just store the facts. We just store the, the series of events. The other part of the, uh, of the event source systems is the read side. Because when you have the journal, we can easily kind of, in the naive implementation, pull the journal and get all the events and reconstruct as many models and as many points of view, view as we want to that, that same stream of events. Because you may have many read models <laughs> and you may have many, read, many event handlers. Because all the events that you saved, they can be fetched by, by side that you may not even know about. They can be fetched from that, and they, these event handlers and read side may interpret that in the way they want. So event handlers may be pushing that data to Kafka, maybe pushing, querying the other systems, sending emails, whatever. The read side may be just building projections of your accounts, for example, for the UI to, to display. So that naturally gives us this CQRS stuff and CQRS goodies that you, are, you have separated this entirely this read model, which is the red one, and the write model, which is the yellow one. Currently, the systems that you are working with, the business, let's say, applications are uh, read heavy. They are way more read heavy than uh, they are write, uh, write heavy. That's why scaling reads is way more important unless you, have, you are working on kind of IoT systems when there's tons of writes uh, from, from uh, devices at the moment. Uh, but if your application is read heavy, you will benefit from this kind of CQRS and even source applications, uh, even source architectures a lot because you can scale the writes kind of infinite, in, inf infinitely. You may have as many projections, as many points of view on the, sa points of view on the same event stream uh, as you want. So business uh, reports, user dashboards, uh, validation systems, fraud detecting systems, you name it. 
And that read side is just a part of the integration with the other systems. So the event source systems doesn't, doesn't uh, live like on, on their own. They need to integrate with other systems. And this is the part where we do that. So again, it's architecture for tomorrow's questions and for the questions that we, that we have at the moment as well. But is it difficult? I mean, we can flip the question and, and ask if the CRUD-like applications are difficult. I mean, if you don't know event sourcing, sure, it may be difficult. If you don't know CRUD, OK, that may be difficult as well. Because if you are coming from event sourcing and you've never seen the CRUD application before, it may be kind of mind-bending. Why are you going to save the state? Why are, you not, why are you not saving the facts themselves? So a few words about the benefits and trade-offs the time traveling and audit trials that I mentioned. Uh, so you saw that uh, as an example. The business comes to you, you have the, all the events since the beginning of the, of the system, and the only thing you need to do is just spend, I don't know, a day, two maybe, building the code that will handle the events one by one and do the <laughs> appropriate projection, do the appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, read model or point of view, the, the way that we want to view the data in. So if, we, if only we have the data saved as an event, uh, we can do any kind of projections that business wants. Audit trials, the same. If there is an auditor coming to you, just give me all the information, all the activities that happened on the account. If you had a crowd-based applications, the best you can do is the logs. I mean, you may have the logs from three months, from half of the year. Maybe you have them, you are lucky enough. But if you don't, the only thing you can get is just uh, uh, the recent state, and that's it. Data insights. Again, any, time, any type of projections that the business may want, any type of projections that you may want as a developer to uh, kind of figure out where are the, maybe not weak points, but the things that you may either improve in your system or where you see that, that the stuff is happening, which tracks are kind of, which, which uh, business uh, uh, scenarios are hot, which are used the most, because you see, and you, see, you see the events and you see all the event flow that you had. You see all the complete user, complete user, user action in the, in the systems. Uh, scalability and performance. The stuff that I mentioned, you can scale read models. You can also scale the right models. Uh, we'll, I hope we'll talk about it uh, a bit more later. Um, but uh, applying the CQRS, which can be tricky, but still it's very, very valuable and very rewarding if, if done properly. Applying the CQRS uh, uh, principle, CQRS uh, architecture to scaling your, your, your software is, is, is really rewarding. Uh, but it's not a, to me at least, it's not a global architecture approach. I mean, if we have in a, let's say, microservices or service-oriented archi architecture, like multiple services in a company, in a software, uh, it doesn't really prevent you from applying the event source approach. No other components, no other systems need to know about the stuff that you're, that you're working, about the, 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 thing that, the, the fact that you are working in your systems with an event source architecture. Because if you look at it, the event sourcing is just a model of storing is just a way of storing your data. You choose uh, storing the facts, series of facts, instead of storing the state as a row in a database. From the perspective of your clients, your callers, or, or the audio systems that you integrate with, it should be completely transparent. If that thing leaks outside, it's probably something to work on. But again, it's not all roses. Uh, there are trade-offs to that as well the inherent complexity, and usually uh, eventual consistency. I mean, if you tell the business and explain them what the eventual consistency is, that the data are not going to be consistent immediately, they are going to be consistent in two seconds, they will run out screaming. But uh, I guarantee you that in most cases, they, they don't really need this uh, strict consistency. They think they need, but they really don't. I mean, there are ways to, to overcome that. And I will show you one of these later. Uh, the inherent complexity, it is complex. I mean, all this dance between events, commands, uh, handlers, and all that stuff is kind of complex. And that's why even sourcing is really rewarding in the projects that have a complex domain. 
So if you're gonna build a blog site, blog uh, engine with event sourcing, I mean, you can, why not? But I mean, it's not really worth doing it. As an exercise, sure, but not as a production, uh, production system. At least I wouldn't, I wouldn't build one. Long-term maintenance and versioning. That's something I'm gonna talk about it a bit more later, but the thing is that uh, if you have all these events since the beginning, you need to care about all these events since the beginning because you, at some point you are going to reply all the events since the very beginning of the uh, of your system's existence, and you need to care, you need to be careful in the versioning. You need to be careful in the maintenance, in the evolving of of your uh, events and and uh, event handlers and commands and all that stuff, in order not to break the compatibility. So, meaning that the feature is no longer used, doesn't mean that you can just clean up the code. And as I said, it's best for complex domain. So you need to ask yourself a question like, and, and uh, give an honest answer. Are you Netflix or are you Google or are you any other Uber or any other big company? Do you really need it? Uh, I mean, you can give it a try in your local, ser local service 102, but just rushing and approaching, let's rewrite everything as an event sourcing system, is not a good option. But again, it's not a global architecture approach. If you want to apply it locally, just to give it a try on some like not that critical system, just to allow yourself for for some bugs and failures, just do it. And requires good domain domain knowledge, because modeling all these um, entities, all these objects that are base for for this event streaming, like which object, how to shape the object that will. That will keep the 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 events. That for which object we should we should keep the events. We should record the events. In the in the Joe's example, should it be account? Uh, should it be kind of sub account? Should it be Joe's as a as a user? Mm, it's kind of tricky, and it requires uh, really good domain knowledge and domain expertise. That's why in a really complex system, event source is usually accompanied with. Um, Mm, with uh, things like event storming to discover the domain, to discover the course of the events, the order of the events, how things are evolving, and and getting to know the domain and discovering all the goods, uh, uh, all the all the objects and all the entities uh, in the system. Okay, the fun part: debugging of the system based on event sourcing, transactions are not finalized, and this one is actually the thing that happened to me three weeks ago or something. We had a system that is doing some processing. External system starting a transaction, we are getting a notified, we are getting a command to do our stuff. And once we do our stuff, we need to send the information, kind of acknowledgement that it was done so that the external system can properly close the transaction. It's a business transaction, not the database one. It's the kind of business uh, transaction. So you may think of it as a transaction in your bank account, for example. And it turned out that we had, a, after some refactoring, we had a bug in an event handler sending confirmations. So the confirmations, the, the, we, we got the events, the stuff that we've done uh, was properly, uh, pr properly finalized. We were supposed to send an event to Kafka, but we didn't. But we said, okay, we, we, we did that, while actually we didn't send that stuff. And we discovered that after a day or two. And now, what we could do in the CRUD-based system when we only have the, the recent state. We don't, we don't actually know what happened. And in an event source system, just replace the events. We know, okay, that thing started happening like two days back. We just somehow more or less figure out what's the moment at time that we want to start replying from. We just reply the events. I mean, before that, we fix the sending, uh, sending the confirmations because otherwise we would have the same stuff. So not worth doing it. Uh, we fixed the bug, we replied the events, all the events were applied by the event handler that was correct this time, so each event was uh, was uh, handled properly by sending the actual Kafka message, and the external system was, was the external system was able to close the connect was able to close the transaction. I couldn't really think of a way how I would do that in uh, crowd-based systems. If I only had the recent last state of the user account, for example, so saying that 
Okay, it's done. It's in a, let's say, idle state. I have no data about what transaction, what were the values, what was the payload, what was the type of transaction, type of action that was taken. And in any events, I just replied them. It took me, I don't know, two hours to build the handler. First to fix the handler, and then to build the, that kind of tiny projections that is one of task uh, that we've built to reply the events from the, the, the given moment and properly send the, send the messages. This comes to uh, uh, also with a, with a kind of distinction between private events and integration events, because not all of your events that you have in your system need to be published uh, to the external world. That's what we have in our systems in this case, uh, because we have series of events and we reacted to them, but the only things that we, re we publish to the external work world are like out of 10 events that we have for single action, let's say, we only publish two of these. And these are not the same events, they are just one event is being... Uh, the other, the public event is being built from one of our uh, private events and then is being sent to the public. That's why we are kind of building the strict uh, distinction and uh, we are not leaking our code and our, our logic to, to the external systems. Yet another point. Uh, where the debugging of the event source systems can be useful and the event sourcing system can be useful itself. That's kind of imaginary one. Uh, uh, user cannot top up account because we are still again in this realm of, of accounts and, and banking and stuff. User cannot top up account for some reasons, getting error. So we know the user, we know that we have a kind of account uh, entity. If we had a CRUD, we would do just that, select asterisk from account, where account is one to three, and we know, okay, this is the state, that column is null or that column is false, while it should be true. And that's easy. In event source way, we don't have that luxury because we don't have the state being stored in a database. Again, what we need to do is to reply the events from the very beginning of the user to the current state. And only then we know what happened. We have all the facts that happened on user account. And by the way, as a result, we get the current state, we get current state of the users. And that's what we, actually what we, what we did uh, in this case. So the one tooling that I built right after starting the event sourcing project on Atlantis and Productions uh, production is usually the stuff, the, the tiny little tool that I give, the entity ID and the time from where or to, uh, from, from which I want to build, rebuild the events or the moment uh, until which I want to rebuild the event stream. And this is a tiny tool and I just use it a lot. If there is a, I don't know, complaint, there is a debugging session that is needed, something is in the wrong state, something is not working, the, usually the first thing I do is just replying the event for given entity to see what was the, the order of actions, whether there was an edge case that was not covered, uh, or, and why is it, uh, why the entity landed in a state that it's uh, incorrect for, for, for given uh, uh, business scenario. So, fixing it. The stuff with uh, user landing in the wrong state. Let's say the flag was, I don't know, enabled flag was true while it should be false. If we don't have a state, like if we had a state, it, just, it would be just, just an update on the database in a Postgres, updating one field and done. In an event source way, that's a bit more tricky. And uh, one temptation is, I mean, we had that and we know that we, uh, that we had the un unhandled edge case. We know how it should work. It, that flag should be actually true while it's false. So just like pinpoint that exact event that set the flag to false, uh, and just rewrite it, like rewrite the flag to from from true to false or the other way around. Don't do that. I mean, you can try, and I've done it once or twice maybe. Uh, it was really stressing because like you are operating on binary data and just the particular event and you have the uh, you know that if you fuck up with that the entity will no longer be correct i mean the, the events will not be able to rewind once the entity comes back so please don't do that events are immutable there is a thing that uh, there's a purpose on the, the the way that we name events because as you, as you, as you uh, may know that events are always named in the past. User created, transaction started, uh, exchange executed. These are the facts that happened, and the facts that happened are kind of undeniable. Like, 
they happened. We, we cannot argue with that. So we should not really touch the events. If they are stored, they are stored there forever. So what to do with that? Instead of overwriting events and risking some um, issues in recovering entities, issue a healing command or generate compensating or healing event. So spend some more time. I know it looks like a bit uh, more work than just fixing, doing an update in a database or overwriting an event as well. Create a new command, create a new event that is dedicated for that kind of uh, situations. Issue the command that will save the event that will correct the state. I know that sounds complex, as I mentioned all the dance between events, commands and stuff. It may be complex indeed, but then you have all the clear history of what happened. Today you know why you did that, why the flag was changed from true to false. But in a year, in two years, I bet you, you won't remember what happened. Either you or your colleague won't remember what happened. You can also try to adapt the events while reading from the persistent storage or writing to the persistent storage. You can try to adapt the events, but uh, in the long projects, long running projects, you will end up with like thousand lines long event adapters and you get lost with that really quickly. One more benefit of this healing events or this healing comments on the, or, or this uh, combo and the dance is that uh, again, auditing, audit trials, uh, and kind of, I don't know, we may have any investigations because user uh, user was not happy and he went to the court raising a, uh, an argument and trying to figure out what happened. And you may get an official investigations from that. And now imagine that you are giving the auditors a uh, fake journal because if you updated the event in place, the journal is fake. This is not really what happened. You may be punished by that a bit. That's why the events are immutable. And if you really don't uh, want to risk, don't touch them if they were stored in, in, uh, in the persistent storage. Healing commands, healing events, clear picture. And by the way, you also force all the projections that, that were done by that time to handle that new event. Because also, if you, uh, if there is a projection or, or business report or kind of event handler that are relying on your event stream, they already applied the event that was uh, broken, that was uh, false. Let's say that had that false or true column. They had it applied. If you correct that stuff in your persistent storage, they won't see, they won't notice the change because no new event will be emitted. They won't be able to handle that change. While if you added, uh, while if you issue the, the healing command and healing event, they will be forced to somehow react to that event. They may ignore it, but they need to explicitly tell that, okay, we don't care. Next thing, feature removal. That's, that's the stuff I, I, I mentioned before. We can remove the feature X business made the wrong decision. Feature, is, feature X is no longer used, just remove it. Yay, the PR is great. Only 10 lines, just adding some plumbing, removing 4,000 lines of code. Works on my machine. I checked. Just checked. It works. All the entities are coming up. Shipping it. This is fine. You can see what's happening. The serialization error or that kind of things. Because you accidentally removed all the code related to the feature. So you remove not only the commands and not only the read parts that are no longer needed, all the reports and stuff, but you also removed, for example, event handlers. You also removed the event classes themselves, like the, the, the models. Uh, and when the entity and the user, for example, is trying to reach his account, he's trying to, your system is trying to rewind all the events since the very beginning. And if the feature was used by the users, it has no way to deserialize uh, the event that was there because simply there's no code for that. So the storage cannot be uh, read, the event cannot be applied, and you're getting the serialization error users getting and getting oops or some kind of some kind of uh, other error messages. That's why the maintenance and feature removal is uh, tricky. And that's why I said that uh, maintenance and versioning of the events is uh, really complex in that kind of uh, that kind of systems. You need 
to know what you are doing when removing, when doing some cleanup, when doing refactors, when doing versioning of that stuff, and you need to care about all the events that you had since the very beginning. The only events you can remove, the only events you can remove from your from your systems are the events that you are 100% sure were never stored in your production system. So if there was no one using that particular feature, no one using that particular uh, use case in your application, only then you can safely remove. Because if at least one event of that type was saved, you cannot really remo remove it. And evolving requirements is also connected to that. Uh, if you have, for example, additional inputs for uh, one of the commands, one of the uh, algorithms that are uh, calculating the balances, whether to adjust or whether not to adjust. There's always a question, should we just, for an event, should we add yet another field? If so, we should probably make it optional, because we cannot really touch the past events, and the past events will not have these additional inputs. Should we add new fields of type optional? Should we have a new event? Should we maybe rewrite the event stream itself? There is a practice like that. Uh, there is also a good, good uh, book uh, by Greg Young, which is kind of father of event sourcing, uh, which is called Versioning in Event Source Systems, since uh, it's available online uh, to read. And the funny thing is that it's 90% done since 2017, and I guess he's not going to finish it. But anyway, there's like tons of uh, good knowledge about versioning and all the tricks that, that are in, in the versioning of event source systems. You may go for rewriting the entire journal and doing it on a site, for example, like adding this new, uh, this new field to the existing events, if you have them somehow. Uh, but usually we do that by either creating a new version of event or creating totally new event, because if there's a uh, change in the requirements, for, let's say, input parameters. Maybe that means that's a different process, different flow, totally brand new flow in your application. It's just a coincidence that business names it the same way. But maybe it should be, maybe it should be like coded as a, as a totally new flow. That's why looking at the, at the system as a series of facts, as a series of events, give you some benefits of, of shaping the, uh, the way the system works. This, sometimes the stuff that business treats as a one thing, you may want to look at it as two separate event streams, two separate entities. Maybe it's no longer an account. Maybe it's something different. Maybe it's account version 2 that has totally different, uh, totally different semantic, totally different uh, uh, inputs to the algorithms they use. Compatibility first. No matter what you do, if you extend the events, if you add new events, you need to maintain the compatibility. That's also related to the previous thing that I mentioned about the uh, about the fixing stuff. Uh, and domain events and integration events, so I mean, I mean the public events, uh, put a kind of boundary between the events that you have in your systems and the events that you publish to the external world. That will allow you to evolve your events, modify your events, sometimes remove them if they were no longer used, uh, if, they are no, if they were never used in production, but it's not going to impact the production systems because you have se separate set of events that are going to, like the, the other, other systems, uh, systems that you communicate with, uh, and they are like distinct sets, they are separated from, from each other. Uh, the versioning book is quite long and it has several different approaches to the versioning and I had like at least three kind of aha moments reading that. Things that I would never have thought about uh, that Greg is uh, kind of discovering there. Uh, new feature request. As a user, I'd like to attach my bank account number to, reali to realize profits uh, and get the money that I earned sent to the, to the account. And the regulation requirement is, let's say that the regulation requirement is that the account, unique, the, the account number must be unique across all users. And this is where we come to this uh, strong consistency versus eventual consistency. If only we had CRUD, we could do it like that. Unique index, we're done. Ship it. But if we have eventual consistency, we cannot really do that because there may be a case that within one or two seconds, there are two users or number of users, if there's a correlated, let's say, attack, 
trying to uh, to violate our 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 rules. So what we can do? Take one together with an event journal, saving the event that uh, user just assigned the account number. Try to update some kind of read model that holds the uh, account numbers and has these unique constraints uh, applied on that. And only when the read model fails because of the constraint violation, we reject this event, uh, event persistence. Looks good. But then there is a temptation that you may start saving many read models at the same time together with the event uh, storage. Uh, if you try to do that, you are increasing a risk of something not going as planned, Some any of the read models may fail, while the critical stuff in these transactions is only event journal. You should probably not save read models together with the event journal, you should recover uh, you should reconstruct the read model from the events themselves, but the events should be separated as, uh, as fast as possible and as atomic as possible. So if you start doing that, you may risk the performance because there's many tables to be updated, sometimes many databases if you can afford a transaction uh, across many different databases somehow, uh, and also the time because you are updating several read models. Uh, but if you think about that stuff different, do we really need a strong consistency here? We can model the, the process in a way that, okay, we save the event that user assigned the account to his account, uh, assigned the bank, num bank account number to his account, but the account is not yet, the change is not yet visible. I mean, the account was not confirmed, let's say. And then we do it for all the users. And there is a read model uh, this gray, uh, this gray uh, cloud. There's a read model that reads all the events, all the accounts that have been uh, that have been stored, and when the account can be stored, and there is this index uh, being applied to the read model part. When the account can be stored, we issue a command to the system. This is the one on top, that the account is fine, that the account is accepted, the account number is accepted. Then we issue a command to the user again: account accepted. Uh, accept account, then we save an event account accepted. If the constraint violation in the if the constraint gets violated in that uh, bank account number validation logic, we issue another command that account was duplicated or whatever name it you name it the way you want, and then after that command we issue an event in a system for given user that account was rejected because of duplication. Looks like crazy complexity, and it may be complex, but then if product people come to you and say and ask that you want some, they want some data from, uh, from, this, from you, from the system, to see how many attempts there were to prevent from, uh, to, to, to assign exi already existing bank account number. Now when, once you have the data, you can tell them, give them report. Okay, this is the, the, all the amounts or the, all the attempts of uh, users trying to uh, gamble trying to uh, kind of violate our rules because you have all the data. You save the data in the in your systems, and you, the only thing you need to do is to just reply them. Uh, exactly once delivery doesn't exist. That's why the 404 here. Again, user transaction summary, some kind of report has the wrong numbers. It turned out that the the read model that was reading your your journal had a kind of hiccup, and it kind of applied the same event from some of the transactions twice. Hence the numbers, the averages, all that stuff is wrong. Uh, that's why I never trust the exactly once delivery. Always in an event source systems, they are eventually consistent for a reason, and you need to care about the idempotency. potency. So anything you read from the, uh, any other system, another part of your system, be it a journal, uh, try to use the item potency, some kind of item potency check. In this case, it's probably easy because uh, every event has some kind of sequence number. So you can tell if you have ever seen that sequence number before or not. That's how the projections in, uh, for example, ACA or, or PECO work. They track, the they, they, they track the journal the moment that they read the journal too, uh, and they save it in a database as an as a, as a index of the position of the journal they, they, they last seen. That's why they never read the same thing twice. Or at least they read, but they don't apply the same thing twice. Performance. I'm talking about replying all the events since the very beginning, but you can see that if we have a system 
which is successful and running for a long time, the event streams may get long. And if you try on every single user attempt, when if you try to, to uh, recover from the very beginning, recover the stream from the, from the very beginning, if you have 10 events, it's fine. If you have 100 events, it's probably fine. If you have 1 million of events, then it starts to getting hairy because every user action takes 10 seconds or something because you need to rehydrate 1 million of events, apply them to an empty state, and only then act on the command that was sent. And also the I.O. costs may skyrocket because every single user event is kind of fetching huge part of the database. Uh, every, every user um, interaction is kind of fetching part of, the, uh, part of the database. That's why the snapshots are here. Like I mentioned that in an event sourcing, we don't store the state, which is partially true. I mean, that's not the core of the event sourcing. The snapshot itself is an optimization only. At some point after, let's say, 1,000 of events, you set up a snapshot uh, thing. So you take the state that you had rebuilt so far and you save it somewhere in a separate database, separate table. Uh, and on the next user uh, access, you only query the snapshot first and only the events after the snapshot. That speeds up the stuff, but that kind of sacrifices the, uh, the flexibility of event sourcing because then you have one more thing to maintain. You still have to maintain the state, which is the snapshot itself. Uh, but it's also valuable for testing like golden testing of snapshots, comparing the, the, the properties if the, if the serializing of the events is right uh, or not. As I said, it's only optimization. Usually, the thing is that if you are getting too long event streams, it probably means that you made the wrong decision modeling your domain. So you may need to take a step back and try to remodel your domain. It may be painful because rewriting the event streams and splitting the, uh, the entities may be painful but it's doable. I've done it twice and it works so far. Uh, so taking a step back on, on, uh, on snapshots is, uh, is a good idea. Maybe you'll uncover something that was not, uh, that, you, that you haven't thought before. Scaling load. Stateless services, they are uh, usually the best ones that we want to have. But then if you are having high uh, like there is tons of writes to your systems. Every single read uh, of the entity to get the state, uh, so we are reading, for example, the snapshot and just a bunch of the events, and then you are writing the, the events to the, uh, to the persistence. If you have the state, uh, if you have the stateless services and you have a bunch of instances, let's say 10, you never know which one of these will get the events. Hence, you need optimistic locking. And the optimistic locking, if there is a spike of a load of the writes uh, to your systems, your data database may become a bottleneck because of the optimistic locking. We start rejecting stuff because the same users may land on uh, two different instances and they, there are going to be conflicts between that. So your d database uh, persistence may become a bottleneck. So on the high traffic uh, applications, maybe it's good um, to think about moving the concurrency control from the database level, from the persistence level, from the logs, uh, to the application level, and going into like clustered solution, whether wh where you can have, for example, Akka or Pekko uh, these days when Akka got licensed uh, badly, uh, when you can get uh, guarantees that within a cluster you have only one node that holds this given particular entity, and no matter which node gets the request, they will be redirected to that single entity of, uh, on a cluster. It will give you way better scaling in terms of uh, uh, scaling abilities in terms of database, but you are trading off the database pressure for the complexity of managing the cluster itself. You may also work with a remembering entities way so that on the start of the systems you are bringing up the critical entities and they stay in the memory forever. Uh, if you cannot really afford for making a snapshot or making uh, or replying the events uh, from the persistent, persistent storage. But be aware it's not a piece of cake, like managing or setting up clusters uh, and dealing with failures of clusters is not a piece of cake. But it's doable and, and, and we do it in our current project. So far it works. Uh, looks like I don't really have time for bonus chapters. Uh, one more 
that I would really want to talk about is what goes into the event. Uh, it's best to say that the events should be self-contained. So you should not need anything more from in, in order to uh, build the projection. Uh, you, d you should not need anything more than the event itself. All the information should be in the event. And if you think, uh, while designing the events, if you think that that given property, should I include that in an event? The answer is probably yes, because it's not your role to decide what should be in an event, what business will need in the future. The more information you have in an event, the better. Even if it's costly. I mean, I saw some uh, systems that uh, people were literally saving the state that they were built in, some, in all of the events, but they were huge. It's not really a good, uh, good option because the state may evolve itself and you will have a compatibility issues. Uh, so figuring out what should go into the event and what should not uh, is a good lesson. In most cases, you should save as much data as possible if they are reasonably small, let's say. Uh, so wrapping up, uh, I know that may sound scary. I mentioned all the Jira cases that were mostly bugs and stuff that we discovered, or I discovered, or I, uh, or I kind of avoided. Uh, but seriously, giving a try, if, if as, I had, as I said, if it clicks at some point that you start looking at the system as a series of events, series of facts, uh, you will never want to go back. Uh, so give it a try but mind the trade-offs and be aware of it. Thank you. <laughs>